Hello listeners, Mark here. As you're hearing me before the show, you've probably guessed correctly that something about this week's recording wasn't quite as it should have been. I'm afraid that uh, fans of Laura's hot British accent may be a bit disappointed since uh, her volume was a bit high during the recording, which meant her voice is rather distorted throughout. I've done the best I can to clean it up, but uh, I'm afraid that it's not quite as good as it normally is. Uh, And as we record two shows at once, this will be the same next week. Hopefully it won't damage your enjoyment of the show too much. Happy listening. Welcome to Season 8, Episode 9 of the Ubuntu Podcast. It's Tuesday, the 5th of May, and we're going to discuss what's been happening in all the news. I'm Laura, and this week, uh, joining me are Alan, Martin... Hello! Hello! <laughs> and Mark. I don't think we really do have a delay that bad. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Hello. It was me not unmuting myself. Hello, Mark. I'm here. So, yeah, we're here. <laughs> yes, did everyone have a nice bank holiday? Yes. Yes. Splendid, thank you. All thrown off by the fact that it's a short week now. Yeah. Yeah. First world problems and all that. Oh, well. Shall we get on with it? We've got a lot of news to get through. Okay. (laughs) And as Laura said, this is the news. The High Court ruled that five of the UK's biggest broadband providers begin blocking five websites offering popcorn time for download. Sky, BT, EE, TalkTalk and Virgin Media all will be forced to comply, just as they have with popular BitTorrent sites like the Pirate Bay, even if those blocks have later rendered useless. As none of the ISPs oppose the order, it's only a matter of time until popcorntime.io, flickstore.me, popcorn-time.se and loads of others are blocked. However, because the service operates using P2P protocols, those already using the software shouldn't experience any issues. Anyone use Popcorn Time? Anyone care to admit to using Popcorn Time? No, I know what it is. I tried it very briefly to see how it worked, and it it sort of didn't quite do what I expected, but what it did made a lot more sense than what I expected. Yeah. What did you expect it to do? I expected I would just like pick a program and say play, and then it would basically stream it but using BitTorrent, whereas in fact what it does is it starts downloading it over BitTorrent, and once you've got enough to play, you can play it. And then it just sits on your hard drive until you realise that uh, you're breaching copyright and delete it. Yeah, it's one of those things <laughs> that, out of curiosity, I've been meaning to have a play with, but have never got round to. Unfortunately, I'm with an ISP that isn't um, draconian, so I could still download it if I wanted to. As am I. Actually, technically, you're not breaching copyright. The person who shared it. Oh no, no, it, of course you're right. Well, if oh, I no, if I are, leave it there, no, because if I've got the, exactly if right I've got now. The, the client yeah. open, yeah. I'm as still, soon as uh, you have the copy on your hard disk, you're now breaching copyright. But if you close the app, it deletes the file. Oh, oh I didn't know by that. Default. Okay. Well, yes. Oh, really? Oh, I yes. I'd never you heard of it. While you're watching. Sorry. I'd never heard of it as so I was reading the article about it, and I have to say, I didn't feel that upset about the whole thing. Cause, what, because it's a naughty program? Because it's a naughty program, and I'm, you know, I'm prepared to be persuaded otherwise. But when people started downloading um, MP3s originally, illegally, the argument then was it wasn't possible to get downloads legally. So people did it, and it pushed the industry into going, OK, yeah, we should do this legally, and Apple started selling them and things like that. So I could have had some sympathy with that, but now people are just stealing movies. And I don't support all the push that the, all the swear that the industry's had on the government and things. But at the same time, just buy the movie. What yeah, if the I, movie's I, not I... available in your region? <laughs> yeah. How common is that the problem, though? Um, Cause generally have you they're... seen the film Interstellar? No. That's not, you can't buy that. that. That's still in the cinema. Right. It's, it's not something you well, can just, buy. Just wait for well, that's fair enough. Just go to the cinema. Yeah, but there are other films that come out in one region before another. You know, the whole movie industry yeah. you know, 
thing of don't release everywhere at the same time. And it, you know, it's, it's, it's less of a problem for me in the UK because, you know, as a modern Western country with cinemas on every corner, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's fairly yeah. straight, very, very easy. But in some countries, actually, you can't because they don't release the film in your country or the TV series. What if there's a TV series you'd really love to watch and, you know, you chat to your friends online and they're all watching it, but you can't because it's not available in your country and the company have just chosen not to distribute it in your country. So I think that argument's, you know, the, the whole it's okay because I can't get it any other way actually holds, still holds on water despite it still being naughty. Um, it still holds water in some locations. But regardless of the, regardless of the naughtiness of what the software does, do we agree that the government should be blocking websites rather than punishing criminals no i and i complete i yeah i don't agree with the whole hard like blocking things and stuff like that but i just sort of feels like they don't have an awful lot of moral high ground mm. here interestingly i was reading through the manifestos for the upcoming general election and uh, the conservatives manifesto says quite straightforwardly that they uh, wish to continue doing and extending this kind of thing Whereas uh, some of the other parties, such as the Lib Dems and the Green Party, say that they want to stop mm. doing this kind but, of but thing. It's, the, it's oh. the current government that instituted the same uh, technology vendor that powers the Great Firewall of China in the UK to facilitate some of this blocking. So, oh, yeah, really? did you not know? <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, we've got we've got mm. the same same technology as China, which is just fantastic, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. What could possibly go wrong? Well, <laughs> moving on, there's some good news, isn't there, Mark? Yes, in a surprising move, Microsoft has released its free new Visual Studio Code Editor, not only on Windows, but also on Mac OS and on Linux. Ooh. Wow. Yes, Amazeballs. so this editor isn't uh, the full Visu <laughs> Visual Studio IDE, which uh, you may be familiar with if you've ever uh, programmed in Visual Basic or .NET, um, but it offers a streamlined UI with code assistance and navigation and integrated debugging on top of general text editing facilities. Uh, and while it's free to download, it isn't uh, actually open source. No, and I've seen a lot of people complain about the um, terms and conditions as well. That it's, you know, it's not only is it not free software, it's also got a hideous set of terms and conditions <laughs> that uh, report back to Microsoft all kinds of things, including your use of the software and what you're using it for yeah. and the code you're writing and your cat's name and all that. I think, I think that's been yeah, overstated like in some respects, though, because if you look at the license, yes, it, it doesn't read well. But I think that it's really there as a provision for them sending um, uh, crash reports and debug information back to Microsoft when it all goes horribly wrong. Uh, and there's and also it's not like go on. Sorry, uh, and there's also a little icon in the in the bottom uh, corner of the editor where you there's a little smiley face and you can click on it and use it to send feedback back to Microsoft based on ah. what you're currently editing and how it's working and if it's working properly and what your suggestions are. So I suspect it's there for them to capture feedback and debug data more than anything else. Right. And most of these yeah. terms and conditions, things like when you upload photos, you know, they're, they're a lot of privacy advocates will say this allows them to use my photos, you know, for yeah. any means necessary when in actual fact, really most of the time is covering them legally for them being able to distribute your content via their own content delivery network or move it around on their own computers because that's what you've asked them to do yeah. um, and and i can see you know there's a lot of chicken little skies falling but i prefer the positive spin on this which is at a microsoft conference they showed off an application running on an ubuntu desktop that that i f i find surprising mm. um, yeah. and you know a good a thing to celebrate and it's more it's yeah. more than that even because if you go to the uh, visual studio code editor website the order that they list operating system support support is linux mac os 10 and windows in that order and the screenshot <laughs> really? and video that's on the landing page is ubuntu we're alphabetically ah, superior is that is that not is does is, is it differ depending oh. on which os you're viewing oh from, well that's probably. clever because i have seen yeah, probably, maybe probably windows, i have <laughs> seen on windows, maybe, yeah. i have seen sites oh, do that. yeah gotcha. well i've only got linux machines so yeah when i yeah. when i it'd be interesting if if one of our listeners could view it or alan. from it or alan oh. yeah, you've got you've got windows and stuff haven't you? <laughs> he's got a, he's definitely got a mac somewhere yeah <laughs> <laughs> moving on martin we've got some more news. 
<laughs> we have. After seven years in development, uh, GNU Mailman 3 has been released. Uh, GNU Mailman is free software for managing electronic mail discussions and e-newsletter lists. Uh, version 3 has a new core engine, is now backed by a relational database and exposes its functionality to other components via an administrative REST and JSON API with the new web interface using Django and also it no longer sends emails to you with your password in plain text Hooray. yeah Hooray. um it's been a long <laughs> time coming but um it's it's pretty great actually there's there's another nifty feature here and that's if you're a python developer you're probably familiar with um virtual env and virtual environments and you can now deploy uh gnu mailman into virtual environments which is just brilliant was it Mailman that we used on the hands list and it would email our passwords in plain text every month? Yes. Yeah. 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 That's the one. You can't, you can't stop the old version of Mailman doing that, I believe. Mm -hmm. it it, just that's how it works, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, uh, Barry Warsaw, who posted the announce to the Mailman announce mailing list, uh, you know, made a point about the fact that it doesn't do this anymore in his uh, in his announcement. Um, it looks like a lot of change because you know, Mailman doesn't seem to have changed at all in the you know ten plus years I've been using it, um, and it just works for the most part. But it seems like they've got some interesting new features, especially the the new web interface, which should please many people because it was a little bit archaic to administer a Mailman mailing list. Um, I'll, I, I suspect it will take a while for those new features to bed in and for people to migrate from ye olde web uh, mailman of yore to the new <laughs> world order of you know, mailman three but uh, yeah look forward to it and i should point out that uh, barry works for us at canonical so that's nice <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yay. who says we don't support upstream software <clears throat> moving on uh Anonymous messaging service Secret, at one stage thought to be valued at more than $100 million, is shutting down. <laughs> uh, founder Dave Bitho, Bitho said, Secret does not represent the vision I had when I started the company, and that he believed in failing fast. The app was created in part to promote free speech, but was criti criticized for promoting cyberbullying. User numbers have dwindled in recent months. Secret said it would return some of its $35 million funding to its investors. Yeah, this is yet another one of those darling uh, projects from Silicon Valley that um, everyone fawned over when it first came out. But I've um, never heard yeah, of it. It's kind of, it, it, it was used, there were, there were people who were posting... Um, you know, interesting tidbits of information from Silicon Valley companies about upcoming products or gossip about a particular person. Like I remember when, well, how nice. I, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, some of it, some of it was you know, and interesting and gossipy, and um, there there was uh, talk of you know particular activities that people at Google had done, which was counter to what their public uh, statements had said. Um, and, you know, because it was in inverted commas secret, you could never know whether this was, you know, genuine, um, or not, or just rumors. Um, That's quite like cosmopolitan for the internet. Right. And there's a whole bunch of these apps now. There's, there's, we've, we've mentioned these in the past. There's the one that kids use. Is it zigzag or something like that, that people use for cyberbullying at schools? So a lot of these, you know, anonymous chat apps are used for that kind of purpose. And you can see why it didn't fit his vision. His vision was more, you know, people releasing interesting secrets, not people having a pop at each other. Which is reasonable, I think. Mm -hmm. Interesting how they managed to value it at $100 million and now not so much. <laughs> so everyone putting their yeah. pinky up to the corner of their mouth when they say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And next, uh, on the 30th of April, Mozilla announced their intent to phase out non-secure HTTP. The goal of this effort is to send a message to the web developer community that they need to be secure. They say, there's pretty broad agreement that HTTPS is the way forward for the web. In recent months, there have been statements from the Internet Engineering Task Force, Internet Architecture Board, World Wide Web Consortium and the US government calling for universal use of encryption by Internet applications. Which is the case? Uh, which, in the case of the web, means HTTPS. Hmm. So is this basically implementing the HTTPS everywhere plugin, you know, by default? 
Yeah, I guess it's probably got something to do with the uh, the Let's Encrypt thing coming along as well. I think it's definitely got ah. some bearing on Let's Encrypt, but also what it seems so, to be is yes. that as they implement new features in Firefox, those new features will only be exposed to connections via HTTPS. Mm. And so the challenge is, how do they determine what new features are? Um, and walking the fine line of compat you know backwards compatibility and um standards compliance so um it's it's a bold bold statement and uh i yeah i think it's worthwhile and we should applaud it but i think that that that's a that's a real difficult challenge i i just wish they'd focus on encrypted media extensions before they um they tackle this one i really want netflix so in does firefox this mean- <laughs> Does this mean that, uh, it, I mean, I, technically implementation, you know, they could just phase out the use of the protocol in, in the browser. I'm sure that technically, you know, it's a switch. They can flick and compile out that, that option. Surely they would leave the door open for users to re-enable it or for system integrators or sysadmins to re-enable it. Cause I can imagine that there's vast amounts of intranet uh, sites which don't use HTTPS and that many companies wouldn't bother implementing HTTPS. Yeah. And equally, you know, I wanted to transfer some files from one machine to another. And the easiest way was to just run Python minus M HTTP server and, and spin up a web server on one machine so that I could get some files across to another machine. And that's got no HTTPS. There's no, you know, security on that. And if I'd use Firefox to connect to that, would it have broken because i had no https on there well they're not they're not advocating that they completely turn off http what they're really saying is that new developments new features in browser standards are going to be enabled for https and may not be enabled for http right Okay, so the, the, the browser was to be capable of running, connecting to HTTP yeah. servers. And, you know, in, in their but. definition of new features, they're talking about, you know, if they have a new parser for a CSS attribute, um, that should probably be available to both HTTP and HTTPS. But if you've got a particular, um, uh, multimedia playback capability, then maybe that should only be available via HTTPS. Okay, that's more reasonable, I think. I found it interesting to see say that they cite the US government as um, one of the groups yeah. calling for lots of encryption. Yeah, but if I they know how to encrypt it. Maybe they would. <laughs> sure. right. uh, or their back doors. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or that they tap in the other side of the connection. So mm-hmm. what do they care if you're encrypting from you know, your end to the, to the border? If they have a, a point of ingress that's behind that border. And if they encourage a standard yeah. way of encrypting, then at least they can be sure they can get in. Yeah. Oh, you cynic. I so. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're just really good guys yeah. deep down, you know. Yeah, they're just people like us, really. Yeah, they're looking out for the children. Just think when did it. we change? When was it that we changed and suddenly <laughs> became so cynical? <laughs> I don't know, I've always been cynical. Don't know about you. <laughs> Martin, save us from okay. this. <laughs> For the past year, Tomio Vizo, Vizozo, I'm terribly sorry if I've just butchered your name, Tomio. Uh, he's been working. You probably have. Yeah, I think so. Well and truly butchered. Uh, has been working on the kernel to bring some Chrome OS features to the mainline kernel. Uh, one of the areas he's currently working on is what Google calls lucid sleep, which is basically the ability of performing work while the machine is in a low power state, such as suspend. Uh, small mobile devices have been able to do this for quite a long while, and this feature brings it to bigger devices that have traditionally been either on or off. Um, a few examples of the tasks that the system could perform while apparently sleeping are um, checking if the battery level is so low that it would be better to completely power down the machine, uh, starting a network backup if the present connectivity allows it, uh, downloading email and checking for new instant messages. Um, this sounds good. Like if you slam your laptop shut and you've just got the glowy light of or close it gently. asleep or yeah, well, I've got a ThinkPad, so I slam it. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, you, it would be nice if, if it could, 
you know, tell me if I've got any Telegram messages or, you know, someone's pinged me on IRC or something, you know, some useful, meaningful thing to me and then light something up. Doesn't Seems your phone like, do that? Uh, yeah. And that's exactly what he's saying. Mobile devices have the ability to do that already. Yeah. So if you've got nice your phone and- with you, then why do you need a light to come on on your laptop when your phone's buzzing in your pocket anyway? Uh, well, you know, it's just a nice thing to have. <laughs> okay. Um, and my, my laptop has a much longer battery life than my phone. Really? Uh, actually, that's really? not true for my battery no, phone. Uh, oh. No. Uh, yeah. Well, here's, here's, when suspended, here's, here's yes. a use case. Maybe it could, maybe a machine could go off and update the, um, the app repository so that when you open the lid, it presents the update manager to tell you what updates are available, for example. Yeah, okay. That's cool. Yeah, that's a, a nice idea. Oh, Just as long okay. as it doesn't start doing things that eat loads of battery. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I like this. I, I I think it's great that that features that. So so, I guess this is the kind of thing that's in Chrome OS that when you if you've got a Chrome Pixel that's got the flashy lights on the outside, you shut the lid gently, and <laughs> you know when you get an email, it blinks those coloured lights on the lid. That's yeah. You know, that's the kind of feature I would like to have in my non Chrome OS laptop. Mm. That's what I'm okay. saying. Is cool. uh, I want those same features and uh, give yeah. them to me. Well, yeah, exactly <laughs> that, and the fact that we're with uh, the new 4.x kernel going to get uh, kernel updates without rebooting the machine. Oh, yeah, you know, that's you may awesome. never need to reboot again. Wow. Oh, that's <gasps> a prompt that will need removing from the Ubuntu Update Manager, isn't it? Yes. Although that technically, that little prompt that tells you you need to reboot doesn't just mean kernel. There are other things mm, that I, trigger I that I appreciate thing, that, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Laura. So on the 1st of May, William Grant announced early support for hosting Git repositories directly on Launchpad, um, as well as what? or instead of bizarre branches. And this is apparently the single most commonly requested feature from Launchpad code hosting for a long time, and it's been in the works for some months, and is distinct from the facility to import code from Git into Bazaar uh, that's been in Launchpad for many years. So, does it... it, uh, Sorry, speaking as someone who's never actually used Launchpad very much, in order to have your code build in a PPA or something, or have you up until now had to have your code in a Bazaar repository? No. Okay. To to build in a P- PPAs are separate from code hosting. So right. Code hosting, yes, you've had to either um, bizarre push your code into Launchpad, yeah. or you've had to import your code from somewhere else where it's hosted in Git or some other revision control system. In order, in order um, to create a recipe for a, an automated PPA build, though, you need to have your code in Launchpad, and it doesn't matter whether that's in a bizarre repository or an imported repository backed by another source code management tool, such as Git, for example. Yeah. Right, but you can, if it was only hosted on GitHub and you just had a page, you, you'd still have to import it into you, Launchpad. You only have, so this actually makes it easier for people who are only using You Git. only have to set that import up once and it then polls and oh, pull, okay. pulls oh, and okay. syncs the right. changes for you. But this right. this is, you know, Git, Git as, an, as a back-end to launch pads yes. so you can mm. do everything with Git, which is it's so great i mean uh we used to use bazaar at work we we um deployed bazaar um for our internal code hosting way back when because at the time it was the only distributed um source control tool available and then a few years ago we migrated to git and Ever since then, you know, recently I've been working in Launchpad with Bazaar, and I'm okay with Bazaar, but oh, I'm so pleased to see Git here now. It's terrific. Do you, do you think this is kind of Bazaar on its way out? Oh, Bazaar's been on its way out for ages. It's been, I mean, the Launchpad has been in maintenance mode for years, mm-hmm. um, and Bazaar hasn't really had any new features for a long time as well, and the the people who really worked on um bizarre in the past uh, like um robert collins and martin paul left the company and no longer contribute directly to it so you know bizarre has not been heavily maintained but it works mm-hmm. you know, and you know we get a lot of flack for ha you're you lost and get one okay well done but we still 
we still use Bazaar every day and Ubuntu uses the, the Ubuntu project uses Bazaar a lot heavily and you know, it, it hasn't stopped us working. Yeah. Maybe we haven't had as many contributions from other people because the, the favorite system. tool is Git and you know, people seem to focus only on one system and they, 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 they are either aligned with one or the other and they don't seem to use both. Well, to be fair, Git only really got popular because of GitHub, I think. Right, and that was another another interesting thing. Someone pointed out on um, on Google Plus today. Dustin Kirkland from the server team pointed out that Launchpad is now the biggest free and open source platform for Git hosting. <laughs> <laughs> As a result of that 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 change that happened last week, because you know while there are others. Um, most of them are proprietary, mm. uh, whereas Launchpad is free software, even though, you know, there probably is only one Launchpad instance on the planet that has Git, you know, yeah. enabled, and that's the one we run. Um, it is possible to run your own Launchpad inside your, your organization if you wanted to. Yes. Mm. Cool. So look forward to seeing that developing further. Indeed. Uh, we have time for... One or two more questions. One or two more. Um, uh, I, th- I think stories. we should definitely mention the uh, the Debian GNU yes. Herd 2015 release. Absolutely. Yeah. The, uh, when was this? This was uh, just uh, last month, wasn't it? Uh, Herd 2015 released. Herd is the GNU project's own kernel, which is intended to be used in place of the Linux kernel for Unix like operating systems. And the Debian release is a snapshot of the unstable version at the time of the last stable release, meaning the software versions are broadly similar. So this um, is for people who don't agree with Linux, and it's going to be GNU Linux. Well, no, uh, this is not Linux. It's it's a completely different kernel. Right. GNU is not Linux. Yes. Yes. Or Unix. Uh, <laughs> is it anything? Well, no. <laughs> well, no. The, the herd, the herd is a completely different kernel. So it's, it's, you know, you could, um, you could boot this up on a machine or in a VM, and you would not be running Linux. You would be running much of the same software, much of the same software that you run on your Linux distribution. But at the very bottom of the stack is not Linux, it's Herd. And, you know, Herd has been a, like a running joke in Linux circles and <laughs> BSD circles because, and it's oh, they're going to release sometime soon. And, oh, are they still working on that? You know, the same kind of jibes that any project that doesn't release very often and has a very small team working on it gets. Mm. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a new release of Debian. I downloaded it and tried it out in a VM and I managed to boot it up fine and, then shut it down again because I have no use for it. But it was interesting that, you know, it's it's possible to do that now. Yay. Um, eBay in the UK have just started selling AMD-based HP laptops that are preloaded with Ubuntu 14.04 LTS. And that was announced today. Mm-hmm. Well, today as we're recording, which is probably yesterday or last week. I don't know. <laughs> That's good enough for my definition of today. <laughs> there you go, Popey. There's another set of machines to add to your potential purchasing list. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, what are, what are they? So, there's three options. Uh, there, there are Ubuntu certified laptops. There's the HP two five five, which is two hundred pounds. The three five five, which is two hundred and fifty pounds, and the ProBook four five five, which is three hundred pounds. Um, they've all got fifteen point six inch LED displays, <laughs> a terabyte of hard disk drive, and AMD quad core accelerated processing units. With this is a- interesting. Well, if you go to if you go to the ebuy.com slash Ubuntu website, there's a nice sort of Ubuntu themed page and it's got nice pictures of the, the Dell XPS thirteen. Yeah, uh, which funny. they don't I sell. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so you can now pre order it and you can buy it properly at the end of May. Two hundred quid, that's quite cheap, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. They look like they're fairly decent machines for that price, actually. Fifteen inch yeah, fifteen it's nice inch having machines. A, like tier one manufacturer. Yeah. Yeah. Selling in the UK. Mm-hmm. And that's the hardware that's list. Yeah, I think that's the end of the news, isn't it? Yeah. And that's it for episode seven. We'll be back next week and we'll be discussing our new setup. No, that was last time. We'll be discussing something else. 
Uh, Something yeah. snappy. Something too snappy. Snappy. Oh. Stuff, stuff today. Um, anyway, we'll bring you some command line love too. I think. Oh. Maybe. Yeah. We need That's to work time. on that. <laughs> <laughs> See you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Stop recording!